Welcome. We are here today with uh, Professor Scott Gerber, uh, who is, I think, the world's leading authority on uh, the uh, uh, judicial career of uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, and he's the author of a book, uh, uh, A Distinct Judicial Power, The Origins of an Independent Judiciary, 1606 to 1687, which is published by Oxford University Press. Uh, he's the uh, uh, professor of law at Ohio Northern University, an associate scholar at Brown's University's Political Theory Project. He has both a PhD and a Juris Doctor from the University of Virginia. His uh, bachelor's is from the College of William and Mary, uh, and he clerked for a U.S. District Judge uh, and practiced law with a Boston firm, Bingham, uh, Dana, and Gould. These used to be uh, sort of the top of the tree uh, in, in the legal profession. Uh, and he has numerous awards. There's too many to, to go over here. He's published five books, 44 articles, 35 book reviews, 98 op-eds, and 27 sundry pieces. So he's also written some novels, most recently, uh, The Art of the Law, a novel, which is about a uh, murder mystery in the art world, which uh, I found very interesting, uh, myself being an amateur artist and, and uh, perhaps even uh, relevant now that Hunter Biden is a world famous artist. Uh, and um, his most recent article was about the misguided minimalism of Donald Trump's uh, Supreme Court appointees, which is actually interesting because I didn't know there was actually a philosophy uh, uh, in what I saw there, craven uh, conformity to uh, whatever Joe Biden wants them to do. But uh, we're gonna discuss that. And most importantly, uh, an article which I read and how I discovered Professor Gerber, and I was delighted to know that he exists, uh, Governor DeSantis and the need for viewpoint diversity in higher education, which praises Governor DeSantis's move to uh, protect against indoctrination at colleges and universities. Uh, and we'll see how successful that turns out to be, uh, or if the Supreme Court uh, uh, won't overturn whatever circuit court uh, repeals it, and they say it's now moot or he doesn't have standing. Uh, so um, that said, uh, I'd like to introduce a Professor Gerber. I understand your father was also a professor? He was. Uh, he was uh, an anthropologist specialized in the Caribbean. Oh, well, that's fascinating because, uh, of course, there's a lot of anthropology you could do about what's going on right now, especially with critical race theory and uh, these uh, uh, claims that are being made about America as a racist society and going back to the 1619 Project. So maybe we'll get into that as well. But let's start with Governor DeSantis. You, as a respected legal thinker, professor, graduate of top universities, you're not a blue collar worker, even an Eric Hoffer. You're totally credentialed and you're endorsing what Governor DeSantis is doing. How can you do that and still continue to teach in a university? Well, I have tenure, uh, so that's how I can continue to teach. They're not gonna, um, I would hope, uh, do anything to me for, for this. And in fact, uh, we, the university that I'm at has a weekly uh, news uh, uh, letter that they send to the alumni and they had this in there. Um, it gets good attention for the university when I do my op-eds and our former provost once said that an op-ed in the USA Today, and I've had a couple of those, is worth $250,000 in free publicity for the university. So um, uh, in terms so in, in terms of my immediate job security, it's fine, I think. But um, of course, it's not popular in, in higher education generally to push against the echo chamber. And you know, I've been doing it for a long time because I believe in higher education in the traditional sense of exposed students to a clash of ideas. You know, and I, I end the piece that you mentioned by quoting Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous remark about the importance of a marketplace of ideas. And then John Stuart Mill's prior but similar statement in On Liberty about that. You can't get crude unless you have differing ideas, uh, you know, in competition. Uh, and this echo chamber approach does not work for the students. And what about for society in general? I mean, you're a law professor. We now see lawyers being 
disbarred, sanctioned, harassed uh, uh, for taking uh, unpopular causes, uh, something I thought was anathema to any principled liberal. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to be more specific on which lawyers you're talking about. Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, it it just depends if if he's you know making up stuff about whether the election was uh, rigged or not. You know, he can't do that. But um, uh, I'm not a particular expert on that. I have my own personal views on that. But um, that's gotten a lot of attention in the media. I'm not sure I have anything much more to say about that. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that these uh, positions of responsibility um, draw from a diverse range of thinkers, not just uh, people that think the same way on the left. And when higher education is just producing kids that are exposed only to ideas from the left, one, the students don't like it. They do not. They want to hear both sides. But it, it hurts uh, society in general because people are just echo chambers. And just because you want something to be a certain way doesn't mean it's correct. And you need to be tested from the other side. So being surrounded by yes people and people that think the same way you do uh, might be comfortable if you're the president or a senator or, or a judge or whatever, but it's not good in my opinion. All right. And let me tell, uh... Well, ask, you said you had some anecdotes yourself as the leading authority on Clarence Thomas. He's one of nine Supreme Court justices. So uh, you should be one of the nine top legal experts in the United States using simple arithmetic. Yet you said you were told that was a bad career move. Can you explain that? Yeah, I was told that several times. I was told that when I initially started to write the book and the origins of the book are actually quite uh, innocent and genuine. Um, I was at the University of Virginia writing my PhD dissertation on the relationship between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution when Clarence Thomas was nominated to the US Supreme Court. And I read that he shared an interest in the same relationship between the documents. And so I just started following what he had to say. Um, and then he was confirmed to the Supreme Court. And so after my PhD dissertation was published as a book. My editor and I, Nico Flund, who's now actually the president of Oxford University Press, we were talking about what I might do next. And, you know, Nico suggested that I do this book about Justice Thomas, you know, an early look, a five year snapshot, what political scientists refer to as the acclimation period. And so I, so I did that. And um, given how much interest there was in Justice Thomas. The book did quite well, um, got reviewed in lots of places, um, National Review, Weekly Standard, New York Times, Yale Law Journal, Harvard Law Review, things like that. And um, so I got a lot of attention for it, sold well, et cetera, et cetera. I was asked to update it. Um, but I've now moved on to other things. You mentioned my most recent book, uh, with Oxford was about the origins of judicial independence in America. It has nothing to do with Clarence Thomas. I once gave a speech at a law school. I was asked to come and talk about my Oxford book about judicial independence. And my host at that law school came uh, to the uh, office where they had been putting me sheepishly and said that some of our, my colleagues, Scott, will not attend your discussion of your book about judicial independence because you wrote a book about Clarence Thomas that they have not read. Um, and that, you know, you're just not allowed to write about that. So they think. And it was just a bizarre thing for professors to do. Boycott a talk about an unrelated topic because someone wrote an objective assessment of one of the nine members of the US Supreme Court. So that's one illustration. Another illustration is, um, Given how productive I am as a scholar, a famous libertarian legal theorist named Richard Edstein um, thought I should be at a, 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 a law school that valued research a lot. And so he spent a, a number of years trying to move me from A to B. And he finally decided that, um, that the fact that I wrote a book about Clarence Thomas that was fair to Justice Thomas had uh, given me a black mark 
uh, that I couldn't overcome in legal education. And just one more quick thought on that. My book about Justice Thomas disagrees with him quite a bit. And he has publicly acknowledged that, he being Justice Thomas, and commended me for it. He said what he uh, uh, appreciated about my book was that I actually read what he wrote and uh, assessed it objectively. And he didn't care that sometimes I thought he was wrong. Sometimes I thought he was right, but he just was pleased that I actually read what he wrote and treated him with the respect that anyone is entitled to, especially a Supreme Court justice. Well, that's very interesting. And it, it's sort of shocking to hear that the uh, blacklisting extends to uh, unrelated topics uh, as well. Um, what kind of response did you get to your article about Governor DeSantis from the public? Did you hear any, uh, any pushback from DeSantis haters? Um, I don't recall receiving any, and I, you know, I'm not sure why that is. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't receive any. I, I, I wrote an, an op-ed just before that in USA Today about the tennis star Naomi Osaka, and I got a ton of feedback on that one. Um, and so maybe it's because USA Today has just, you know, two and a half million readership. I, I don't know what it is. But you know, the Tampa Bay Times is the biggest circulation newspaper in your state. Um, but I don't recall uh, getting any response to it directly. I'm Did you hear sure. any, any response from Governor DeSantis's office? No, no, I didn't. Um, not even I mentioned, those thank you uh, or great article or whatever? Uh, no, I mean, I didn't expect that. I've never met the man. Um, I just read about his concern about the lack of viewpoint diversity in higher education. And I had been writing about that myself in my career. And I uh, thought I would just write this piece. And uh, the Tampa paper was nice enough to be interested in it. Um, and so, no, I haven't heard from the governor. I don't expect to. He, he doesn't owe me uh, any response or anything like that. He's busy, obviously. If it were me, sure. I'd put you on some board immediately. Uh, <laughs> let me. Uh... Let me ask you another question. You talk about viewpoint diversity in higher education. How can you have an adversarial legal system if one side is uh, suppressing any other side? And we have statements like Joe Biden years ago uh, said there is only one side. I think it may have been about Black Lives Matter. How can you people, he's a lawyer. He was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. How can somebody make a statement like that in good faith and why was there no reaction immediately from every law professor in the country saying this goes to the heart of our judicial system in the country and indeed our political system. You can't have it if there's only one side. That tells me you're un-American. Yeah, why there was no reaction from higher education, it's because they think there is only one side for the most part. Not everyone thinks that way, uh, but too many people think that way. And it's hypocritical. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about um, some other anecdotes and other pieces I've written. I wrote a, a review in the uh, Journal of Legal Education about Steve Presser's history of the law professorate. And one of the things I point out at the end of that is, um, you know, the law professors were opposing uh, Jeff Sessions' confirmation as attorney general. You know, these were the same people that were arguing to the Congress that lying under oath uh, and obstructing justice is not um, an impeachable offense. And they were defending Bill Clinton, right? And so they just attached labels to it. Jeff Session was a, a Republican, so he's evil. Bill Clinton was a Democrat, so he's allowed to perjure himself under oath. Um, that's how bad it is. It's a real crisis, it really is. Uh, I understand you're involved with the Federalist Society. And uh, do you think the Federalist Society understands the seriousness of the situation? Oh, sure, I mean, I, I'm involved in the sense that, you know, I've, I've given talks uh, to student groups, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, student chapters at other law schools, and I go usually go to their faculty conference because you can present papers there, and 
and things like that. But, but yes, I mean, the origins of the Federal Society, and I know one of the co-founders quite well, uh, Steve Calabrese, um, was that when Steve was in law school, he was take, taking a course from Owen Fiss at Yale. And Owen Fiss made some kind of snide remark about Ronald Reagan being elected president. And so he kind of said, oh, I bet, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that, but I bet no one voted for Reagan anyway. And so Steve apparently raised his hand and said that Steve did. And so that then led to, you know, Steve and some other people um, forming the Federal Society. And the Federal Society does it right, does it properly. They, they prefer debates. So they prefer that uh, if, if I'm invited to speak or Randy Barnett's invited to speak or Richard Epstein's invited to speak or whomever it might be is invited to speak, that there be someone on the left that provides a counterpoint and that there's a debate. And it's, so that's how it should be. And that's their model. They don't try to censor people on the other side. So that I actually commend what they do in that regard. And uh, how successful have efforts been to diversify law school faculty uh, viewpoint diversity wise? Uh, I give it an F. Um, you know, to her credit, before she uh, went into the government, when she was dean at Harvard Law School, I think Elena Kagan did try a little bit of that. You know, she hired a couple prominent conservative law professors away from other places and had them at Harvard. Um, and I know Larry Kramer before his deanship ended at Stanford, you know, he brought in Mike McConnell who uh, was very conservative law professor and then a 10th circuit US Court of Appeals judge. But, you know, that's one or two people. Um, and I, in my piece of uh, uh, supporting what Governor DeSantis said, I quote this famous remark from uh, uh, Nicholas Quinn Rosencrantz, where he essentially says that he teaches at Georgetown. And he said at the time of his remark, there were three libertarian or conservative professors at Georgetown Law School and a faculty of 100 or so. And he jokingly said that most of his colleagues on the left think that there's two, two, at least two too many, right? So three out of 100, and they only want one out of 100, if that. So it, it's not been good and it's, it's terrible. Uh, higher education uh, uh, resists the type of diversity they should value the most and that's viewpoint diversity, they oppose it. And what about the argument in terms of representation? Let's take out the intellectual argument. One of the arguments made about uh, higher education and workplaces in general, uh, is the hostile environment uh, claim. That in other words, unless people are represented uh, essentially proportionally uh, to their uh, percentage in the American population, uh, you have a uh, disparate impact. Uh, and that uh, in fact, uh, it's evidence of discrimination and it can create a hostile environment that has a chilling effect so that it actually uh, is uh, illegal. Uh, under the civil rights laws. In other words, if there's discrimination against uh, conservatives in higher education, they're not being represented as such, uh, let alone, as you said, libertarians or people maybe who are in the middle of the road who aren't particularly leftist or rightist, just old fashioned liberals, I would say, are probably uh, endangered species as well. None of this seems to be an issue. Yeah, on the illegality point, I'm not sure if uh, political or viewpoint uh, uh, diversity uh, is a protected category under the law. Um, so I'm not sure there'd be much of a legal claim there, but there's a, there is a best practices claim. Okay, well, religion is protected under the yeah, law. Yeah, religion for sure. Well, yeah. how, many, how many Orthodox Jewish professors, how many uh, 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 fundamentalist Christians, evangelicals, how many Catholics, uh, 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 who are believing, uh, you know, uh, 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 followers of, of Catholic catechism. How many do you have there? Yeah, um, in terms of, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, what's his name? Uh, Jim Lindgren uh, at Northwestern, his studies speak to that. And he finds that the most underrepresented groups 
in legal education are Republicans and Christians. Um, so it's, it's not women or African Americans that are underrepresented. It's Republicans and Christians. And yet, again, there's no concern by Republicans or most Christians, I think, to, to do anything about it. Yeah, I guess you have Liberty University and, 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 and uh, uh, I don't know what. Uh, uh, the, the other thing is um, you have a, a question of, uh, well, I, I knew a guy years ago in Washington, Tim McGuire. He was a student at Georgetown Law School and he uh, somehow got into the affirmative action data and he published uh, the disparity in SAT scores between uh, minority uh, law students and um, uh, non-minority law students, which was a substantial gap. Uh, and uh, um, it came out and uh, he was, uh, working at a major uh, Washington law firm as a uh, legal, uh, you know, I don't know what you call it, associate. And uh, he was called in by one of the big, of course, I can't remember the name, old Washington lawyers and told, well, at the end of this year, you know, we're, we're letting you go. And I don't think you'll ever find a job in a Washington law firm again. Uh, and um, in fact, he ended up, uh, he had to go work for the, uh, um, the immigration, uh, they, they changed the name, but you know, ICE, what's now ICE, and he became an ICE attorney. His, his legal career was over. Uh, uh, now, here's a question. If there's a commitment to truth, the revelation of truth should spark debate and discussion. I mean, maybe you wanna say, no, we don't want just lawyers who are good at taking tests. You know, well, you can justify it. I mean, you can make a case but you don't suppress the information and then punish the truth teller if you want to have an honest legal system. It would seem there's an issue of fraud involved. So you have systemic fraud based on false premises. In other words, if a person say, for whatever reasons, personal, cultural, or heredity, whatever the factors are, you're from an anthropological background, uh, less likely as a group to succeed in law school, you may say that's not, important because we feel representation is the number one issue. We want to represent all groups. Okay. However, then when you get into judging cases or taking cases, perhaps they're not able to make a sophisticated argument to compete with others. Then you have to change the basis of law to be based on mere application of a template in an administrative function, which they used in the Soviet Union which they used in, in fascist countries, law becomes an administrative rather than a judicial function. And so it actually undermines the rule of law by changing the criteria of selection of who's gonna be a lawyer because they're no longer legal thinkers. And uh, what's interesting to me, if you compare Clarence Thomas to President Obama, so there's no racial incident. My opinion, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, but Clarence Thomas seems to be a legal thinker. And President Obama does not. He does straw man arguments and empty rhetoric. And that's it. And I don't even know, honestly, how he had a legal career. Uh, uh, he seems to be, he taught constitutional law. This is a man who seems to have no sense of the constitution. This is your field. Uh, anyway, these are just my thoughts. Uh, what's your reaction? Um, well, I've written a lot about the need to make decisions in admissions and hiring on the basis of merit. So I agree with uh, your concerns that when you move away from merit, you hurt the system. Um, it's unfair to people. I mean, this stuff, just to talk about myself for a second here, it's affected my life, literally, to not be judged on the merits. Um, you know, and I, you know, I, I have the job I have because at the time I was hired, the law school I'm at was on probation for not having enough faculty published. I was told that. So they hired me and, you know, I helped them get off probation. Um, but, you know, I have 200 and I don't know, 15 publications now. Uh, they get cited a lot. Um, and I am where I'm at. Um, and then, you know, other people 
can't even get in the door. You know, I know people that would like to be professors, not only in law teaching, but in history and political science and English and the like. Uh, that go to wonderful institutions, Princeton, Yale, places like that, and they can't get jobs uh, because of their skin color or their gender or their political views. And that's just wrong. It, it's immoral. It's illegal too, by the way, but it's also immoral because it affects the kind of life someone can live. So I, I, I want things judged on the merits, you know, and if people compete against me and are better on the merits, more power to them. I'll congratulate them and move on. Uh, but if I get disqualified just because I'm not on the left or because I'm white or because I'm male or because I'm over 40 now or whatever it might be, whatever boxes they're trying to check, by law, they're not allowed to check. But that's all they are interested in for the most part. They're emphasizing things in these decisions that by law, they're not allowed to even consider, literally, and they do it anyway, and yeah. lie about it. And so how can you have law schools that are committing, I don't know whether you call them crimes or infractions, violations of law consistently, and yet there's never any recourse or repercussion. How can you have a legal system when it's actually a system of lawlessness? Yeah, it's difficult. It's broken. You know, I, I, I'm circulating an op-ed right now where I, uh, you know, it's, a, it's about the Cuomo thing. Uh, but I touch on this kind of thing just a little bit in there. Um, and these enforcement uh, systems, EEOC, for example, they're broken. And on the Cuomo thing, one of the points I make is why didn't his accusers file EEOC complaints? And the reason is because they're afraid to be retaliated against if they do. They literally said that to the investigators. And of course, there's anti-retaliation provisions in these statutes. But because the EEOC, for example, or OSHA, whomever it might be, is so understaffed, uh, they don't enforce it. And the people in power, whether it be Cuomo or university administrators or whatever, they know that. And so they just think they can get away with it. And uh, so at the end of the day, you just have to count on people's honesty and good faith. And lots of times they let you down on that. But, you know, I can sleep at night. Sometimes I wonder if they can. So uh, what is your next project? Well, uh, you know, I submitted uh, a, uh, my next book is on law and religion in colonial America. I submitted that to the publisher and, you know, I'm waiting to, to hear what kind of feedback I get. And so my newer one that I'm just starting on is also about early American law. And I'm looking at those colonies that were founded for non-religious reasons. The one I just shipped off, I looked at the five colonies that were founded for religious reasons. Uh, Maryland, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. And so in the one I'm just starting, I'm looking at the ones that were founded for different reasons, like to make money and the like. New York. Uh, yeah, New York, Georgia. You know, I've, I have a terrific, absolutely terrific research assistant this summer, and he's really done yeoman's work and plowing through the Georgia colonial records and finding just wonderful things that I can use to tell a story about colonial Georgia. And, but I have other ones to do. And these kind of things, given that I do legal history, it'll probably take me 10 years, the last one did. But that's what tenure is for. Tenure is so, uh, at least in my opinion, to free scholars up to take on big projects like that. Uh, it's not so you can sit back and, uh, and impose your political views on other people not what it's for. Let me ask about uh, colonial history, since this seems to be a new area of expertise uh, that I wasn't aware of. What do you make of the 1619 project and its goal of uh, delegitimizing uh, the American experiment entirely and saying you'd have to go back to 1619 when there wasn't even a United States? So just simply erasing both the Declaration and the Constitution. Yeah, no, I, I think it's flawed. I mean, I'm just co coincidentally, we're talking and I'm sitting uh, in Hampton, Virginia, where 
1619, the first Africans were brought over on the ships. Um, but, uh, you know, my friend Gordon Wood, he has publicly criticized that. I mean, the argument that the proponents of the 1619 project seem to be making is that uh, the American Revolution was fought because uh, to protect the institution of slavery. And they were afraid that, you know, we couldn't continue to do that if we weren't uh, independent. And uh, historians like Gordon Wood and other prominent people have said that's just historically baseless. It's just not true. Um, and so I, I think it's just wrong on first principle. Doesn't mean slavery didn't exist and that slavery was, was not a horrible thing. Of course it was a horrible thing. Um, but there's other things that historians should write about also. But what about the argument that, uh, I mean, it's interesting, are all your books still published by Oxford University Press? Uh, no, I mean- um, I mean the scholarly ones. Yeah, no, the, my, my first ones were uh, uh, New York University Press. The Clarence Thomas book was that. And that's, uh, Nico Fund was my editor there. And then because he was just so fantastic, at a very young age, he moved over to Oxford and actually became president of it, of the whole darn thing. Um, and so my last one was Oxford and I'm hoping to continue that string going. So let's talk about publishing. A lot of people think, myself included, that publishing has become very uh, woke or politically correct or ideological, whatever you wanna call it. Have you ever had any run-ins in publishing with these committees on diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity, and so forth? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, but I, I do um, I do academic, in the weeds work. Uh, you know, I write op-eds and things. That's a whole different side of my brain. Um, but, I, you know, I have no agenda. So to, to talk about the Oxford book for a second. I had no idea when I started that book what I would find. No idea. I was just interested in the topic because uh, I kept reading little stray comments from Gordon Wood saying that someone needs to do a history of the origins of judicial independence in America. And so before I even knew him, I sent Gordon an email and I asked, does that mean you're doing it or one of your students is? And he said, no, it just means that someone needs to do it. So because it married my three interests, law, history, and political theory, I took it on and I found uh, what I found. And it was, you know, the, the anonymous reviewers for the book praised it to the sky. Uh, the reviews of it when it was in print were very positive. Uh, and so I just keep my head down and sit in my chair and write my scholarship. That's what, I, that's what I'm uh, paid to do. That's what I got into higher education to in fact do. I don't want to indoctrinate students or anyone else. I want to exchange ideas with students and everyone else. That's what it's about. And nobody uh, to this date has rewritten your material or made you insert things or changed it uh, or rejected it. Uh, that's very interesting because uh, so much academic publishing uh, and I'll send you we published this one uh, academic book by a former professor of mine uh, um, because he was afraid he didn't want to deal with academic publishers because he'd heard so many horror stories. Uh, so uh, uh, I guess you've had a good experience uh, and, and uh, that gives us some hope that- uh, Yeah, with my books I have, I'll give you one anecdote um, in a journal. I mentioned this, the Journal of Legal Education, which is the prestigious journal uh, published by the Association of American Law Schools. Um, the, 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 one of the editors of that journal kept resisting my comments about the politicization of legal education. Uh, he backed off eventually, but I saw this email, you know, after, it was, after he gave up on trying to convert me to the left, he, he actually said something like, you, you know, you're wasting, your, you have a lot of talent, Scott. Why are you wasting it like this? Wasting it? I'm just telling, describing what I think the facts are, right? But he characterized opposing 
this dominance by the left in legal education is a waste of my talent. I think it's a good use of my talent, frankly. Well, I'm grateful you're doing, I mean, it's, you sound like a principled person, which is uh, a rare quantity uh, uh, to run into these days. And uh, I guess we'll wrap it up with that. Uh, I, I thank you for giving me the time. By the way, do you know Glenn Reynolds uh, of Instapundit? And sure, absolutely, I know Glenn. I, you know, I, I was at a symposium at the Tennessee Law Review. Glenn teaches at Tennessee. Uh, you know, Glenn's uh, 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 highlighted a couple of my op-eds over the years on Instapundit. Yeah, I know Glenn quite well. Nice so guy. You're, you're, uh, are you confident, though, that there's enough of a critical mass of uh, principled uh, lawyers out there to make a difference? Or do you no, see I'm yourselves as, as, as endangered species, so to speak? Yeah, endangered species. And it, it, it's hard, you know? It's hard putting... Put, uh, the myth of Sisyphus, to continue to push the boulder up the hill and have it roll back down on you. Uh, that wears you out sometimes. All right, we'll have to start a safe, endangered, uh, uh, honest, fair-minded uh, professor's uh, uh, cause and see if we can get as much sympathy for, uh, for uh, uh, principled uh, uh, academics as for whales or, uh, or dolphins or for uh, uh, any other endangered species out there. Um, I want to thank you, and uh, I will wrap it up now. And then if you'll just stay tuned for a second, I just want to do a little post chit chat. Okay, stop.